Thing now, yesterday, man. And we're live. It is Tuesday, November 24th, 2020, 502 p.m. Kate has her pipe. Mm -hmm. there, has been a, there has been a dusting of snow in Madison, Wisconsin. Are we going to it? Are we Dane show it? County, Wisconsin, a dusting of snow. Yes. In Washington, there has not been a dusting of snow. But there's there a hammock. Been, but there is a hammock. I am here from the hammock studio, which I think is now going to be the official recording spot of In Lieu of Fun. Jordan Ellenberg, since the last time we've had him on, has grown, I think the technical term is a veritable shitload of hair. Um, he now looks like an Edward Corrin character from those old New Yorker cartoons. We might say he looks like a Muppet. We might also say that he looks like Louis Calico, with whom he and I went to high school. Um, I'm glad you said that, and it wasn't someone I was supposed to know. No, no, he's no. a Lewis is a very fine man in 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 uh, uh, Ontario, and uh, Jordan and I went to high school with him. Um, and uh, we're not allowed to have fun anymore. Uh, you're in like the center of the part of the country that's not allowed to have fun anymore because you've got like <laughs> raging COVID over there. But in lieu of fun, by popular demand of the audience, we have Jordan Ellenberg back. And I do want to tell you, Jordan, your presence was actually demanded by the audience. I kind of resisted it because I- I thought you were making it, that up. I thought you just asked me. Well, that is awfully nice. No, it's no, no. People, it's you, multiple people in the audience said, bring that Ellenberg character back. Well, based on the chat, I think it uh, largely it must be the Madison contingent. There is a lot of Madison love going on in the comments, which I absolutely love to see. Madison is a city with partisans. I don't know if you know that. There's like a lot of, there's a fandom. There's a fandom of Madison, Wisconsin. There are a lot of people who like Madison, Wisconsin, where I have never been because my travel is largely, not completely limited to places I get invited to speak. <laughs> and I've never been invited to speak at Madison. Um, so, so therefore, I've never been there. Um, Kate's travel is also largely limited to But I go to lots of random places like Madison. Like I, I get invited to speak at, like get inspired to speak at like- That was that The, past the past Ohio past? State University. So, yeah. Jordan, I don't know where to start with you today because, like, I could make an argument that we should talk about uh, polling error in Wisconsin. I can make an argument that we should start with uh, 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 COVID spread. Uh, we could start with your book. We could start with, like, what do you what are you thinking about these days? Let's start with that. Um. Let's start with the book and go from there because I'll get in trouble if I don't talk about it. And I don't like getting in trouble. I'm like a law abiding. All right. Yeah. Let's let's start. When's the book coming out, Jordan? And what's the title? And do you have a copy you would like to hold up? I don't have a copy yet because we're in early stages. The book is coming out in on May 25th. So a long way from now, May 2021. Uh, the book is called Shape. And everything in it is about geometry in one sense or another. So I think I was like into it, but I still had a lot left to write when we last talked. And now it is put to bed. I turned in final artwork. There are, I think, uh, 106 hand-drawn drawings in it, which I all had to do on my iPad Pro. So I sort of, uh, I sort of redid and touched up all of those over the weekend. Um, but I think we are going up for pre-sale next week. So you can actually buy it, right? You won't get it. But you can purchase it. Um, and that's and what is it? So it's all about geometry, but it's kind of, you told me it was kind of in the same spirit as how not to be wrong. So what, what, how do, how do you not be wrong using <laughs> geometry? Well, we've all been, I mean, we've all been wrong a lot, right? About, and we can sort of go back to what we said about, uh, about uh, COVID and about sort of disease models and spread, which we talked about when I was last on and which there's a lot about in the book. Um, it's been a, a somewhat humbling experience, right? For people who are thinking about these things mathematically, it sort of helps us know sort of how much we don't know. Um, but what I would say, speaking loosely, is that, um, 
any context in which we care about which things are near which other things is a fundamentally geometric context. So in the context of an epidemic, that might say like there have been a lot of epidemics in the history of humanity and actually in the history of like animals and plants too. For animals, it's an epizootic. Did you know that? I learned that from uh, writing this book. Um, and in some sense, everything that we do when we try to do things predictively is say, um, which epidemics in the past is this epidemic like? Like what's our notion of similarity and which things are close to which other things? In some sense, every kind of prediction we do, whether it's weather or whether it's election polling or whether it's epidemic is, uh, is to say, here's the situation now, what situations in the past, is it similar to? And then we'll expect that this will behave the way that similar things behave. But this notion of similarity is a fundamentally geometric notion because we're asking how close things are in some kind of conceptual space of all possible epidemics or all possible political conditions or all possible weather conditions or, or what have you. And is similarity in geometry similar to similarity in non-geometry? I mean, when, I, when you say similar colloquially, you mean reminiscent of in some... Sharing salient features. Sal sa sharing yeah. certain salient features, right? Recognizably related to. But when you say similar to in geometry, you mean having the same angles as, right? You mean something much oh, more. Okay. Um, so what I would say, first of all, I would imperialistically say there is nothing outside of geometry. Like once you're talking about <laughs> similarity, you are essentially thinking geometrically. And the question is, how can we have a notion of space that is general enough to sort of encompass uh, things that we don't traditionally think of as being on the plane? But there's, okay, look, there's a slogan that runs through the book, which I love, and it's a slogan of Henri Poincaré, the kind of great geometer of the turn of the century in France. Um, you know, and what he said is geometry is the art of calling different things by the same name. That's basically what we're doing. And all the meat is there, sort of like figuring out which things we're gonna call the same. So in this classical context that you refer to, you might say, well, these two triangles are kind of the same shape. They have the same angles. One's a lot bigger than the other, but maybe I don't care about that. Maybe I'm gonna say they're similar because in this moment, what I care about is, is the shape, like what the angles are. And I don't care if it's big or small. In a different context, you may really care whether it's big or small. And then you have a different notion of similarity. So you're like, those two things aren't similar at all. Oh, I realize that because I'm sitting close to the screen, you can't see my wild gesticulations at all. So I'm holding- No, we fine. can't see your wild gesticulations, but that's okay, we can, we can imagine them. <laughs> So Jordan, I studied um, in undergraduate and took some, and for a little bit in graduate school, um, cognitive psychology and like basically like similarity tests, like the early stuff that um, Kahneman and Traversky have done. And then like on to like Doug Medine and like a whole bunch of um, a whole, there was like an entire field in cognitive psychology in like the early eighties that was looking at kind of what what it was that made what what changes the salience of different features like you just described size as being like okay we were going to decide that this triangle is not that similar to this other triangle because they are so different in size even if they are the exact same shape but that's the salience of the feature that's like kind of coming back and forth but like i okay you're gonna have to forgive me and then i have a question about topology but like there is a like I'm very curious as to like, you said everything is geometry once you get down to it. Like, tell me how a lemon and a gorilla can be categorized by their similarities or differences in terms of geometry. Like, is that, that's not what you're talking about or is it? Uh, of course it is. I mean, so if for instance, let's say you were the person in charge of developing something like GPT-3, like sort of some kind of automatic text generation device that is meant to sort of produce sentences that sort of can plausibly be read as English sentences conveying some meaning. Um, or in a more simple thing, you're like the Google autocomplete, right? When you're typing in your Gmail and it's sort of predictively uh, saying what it thinks the next few words are going to be. Um, there are it has to figure out whether when you say, um, I turned the corner and saw a, like whether it should say lemon or gorilla, right? That's a choice it has to make. And depending on the context, um, if you've been talking about citrus, right? It's more likely to sort of say, oh, lemon is similar to the things you've been typing about and gorilla is not. Whereas if you're at the zoo, it can sort of be like in this context, okay, I can see the gorilla as a more likely thing that you're about to encounter. So there is like 
a space of concepts, or maybe for something like text generation, more specifically, a space of words. And I think it does make a lot of sense, and there's lots of really interesting research about going back to the 60s, actually, both by cognitive psychologists and by artificial intelligence people about what we might mean by the geometry of words. What does it mean for two words to be close to each other? Um, even like, what is, um, I write in the book about these kind of really interesting ideas about like interpreting analogies between words as the relationship between two words being the same as the relationship between these two other words um, can be sort of modeled by, oh, they're the same distance from each other in the same direction. If you want to talk about like vectors and stuff like that. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of that stuff actually, but I sort of talk about it because it's super interesting and try to sort of maintain an appropriately skeptical posture at the same time. But definitely, yeah, concepts, there's a geometry of concepts, there's a geometry of strategies, there's a geometry of uh, epidemics, um, there's a geometry of everything. All right, so speaking of geometries of everything, we are joined at this particular juncture in the narrative by my older child, E.J. Wittes, who Yay. has a question. Uh, E.J. has gotten very into weaving recently. Yeah. And uh, has a geometry question related to yarn. So, yeah. except that EJ seems to be frozen. No, no, Wait. EJ's back. Okay. Sorry, can you hear us? There. I'm trying to move to get better Wi Fi. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's the question I've been teaching myself to weave the last few months because quarantine. Um, and so I've been taking a lot of skeins of yarn and rolling them into balls of yarn in the course of doing this. So I have come to be wondering about how to estimate the volume of a ball of yarn given the length of the yarn that is being rolled into the ball. Because obviously the volume of the ball is greater than the volume of the yarn itself because it's not packed perfectly. But I don't know how to figure out how to pack it to minimize the volume. And it's bothering me so much. There you go. I love this question. So that is a super awesome question. I'm not gonna answer it, um, but I'm gonna say some stuff about it. First of all, I would say, as things go, I think yarn is probably packed pretty tightly. So the amount of volume you lose is like probably not that much. Um, if you compare it with, I mean, it's sort of a question that being that is much studied is I have a bunch of marbles or something or anything else is roughly, roughly spherical, like lemons, for instance, just to make that connection. Um, if I have a bunch of marbles and I put them in a bowl, you really can't fill up that much of the space. Like there's inevitably a sort of inefficiency because spheres don't pack together very well. But the question of um, how, just how much of the volume you can use with packed spheres um, is actually, well, in three dimensions, we know the answer. In higher dimensions, where it's where it really gets interesting, it's still a mystery. Um, it's something uh, that John Conway, who unfortunately died of COVID like few, a few months ago, the great geometer John Conway, who's in my book, wrote about a lot. Um, for um, So I'll tell you who thinks about this question of now we're talking about a, a yarn is like a long cylinder, right? A long flexible cylinder, much longer than it is in a cross section. Um, who is it who studies the properties of very tightly packed together uh, long strands into a ball? Well, people who weave, that's one group of people. But String theory, no, I'm joking. Not string theorists, those are different. Long we can talk about that too. Um, no, but it's- I know, I it's the molecular biologists because DNA does this. I mean, we now know it tangles in a very interesting way and it's actually sort of important how it tangles. So there's a biologist called Erez Lieb uh, Lieberman Aiden, or maybe it's Erez Aiden Lieberman, um, who gave a wonderful colloquium in Wisconsin about this stuff. And um, you can actually, with all these kinds of magical tools they have for seeing like which uh, sites on the molecule are in contact with each other, with, which other sites, um, you can kind of measure like just how tangled a, you say skein or skein? I don't actually don't know how to say this skein. word. A skein, like how tangled a skein is. So a lot of the interesting work um, on this area is is, um, is from biologists. 
And I think he could tell you about how much of, like literally how much space in the nucleus is like used up, is, is filled up by sort of a certain length of RNA. And guys, I actually forgot whether it's RNA or DNA. I'm sure someone in the chat can tell me which one I'm talking about here. I'm pretty sure it's RNA. I think the DNA is as like the double is more the the more complete kind of double helix. I think RNA kind of is scrambly, but I could maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so on this note, this kind of segues into my my next question. That I would I have to ask this question: Does a straw have one or two holes? Wait, are you asking this because you know I wrote like literally a thirty page chapter about exactly this, or just because you're <laughs> obsessed with it? Like the also. Rest of the also because I'm like semi obsessed with it, but I, I would, but I know, I also know that you've written about it because I wanted to make sure I was like that you, yeah, anyway. So I would, so the answer I come to after really thinking about it a lot and watching a lot of really entertaining YouTube videos, which you can watch too, about like people arguing about this is that and you're gonna be so mad because this is like one of those like annoyingly nomic questions that unasked the question is that it has two holes, but they're the same hole. Do you hate that answer? Like kind of. I mean, <laughs> Ben, what's your intuition on straw on a straw? Does a straw have one hole or two holes? I'm not seeing the two. Where where would the where would the second hole be? At with the other one end and the other end. I, I, we broke I would, ben. Yeah, so I would say I know, I broke ben. my my my, my uh, unstudied intuition about this is that we're talking about one hole that goes from one end of the straw to the other. But I could be persuaded that there are two holes that meet in the middle. I mean, maybe a slightly better way of expressing when I said that there are two holes that are the same hole is that there, there are two there are. There's two holes, but one hole is the negative of the other hole in the sense that if there's milkshake flowing through the straw, if it's going in one end, it has to be going out the other end. And the amount that's coming in one end ends up being the same as the amount as the the amount of the, the, the increase in milkshake through one end of the straw. Well, I suppose is, that's is, right. I suppose that's right because if it, if it only had one hole, it would be a teacup, right? A teacup with a handle or a teacup without a handle? No, no, no handle. But but is a but teacup like, a hole at all? A, a teacup has one hole at the top, but not the other hole, so that the the material can go in, but it can't yeah, come out. Same emoji right now, like this one, like. <laughs> I know <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the okay, teeth grinning so, emoji, like I this logic doesn't question, add up. <laughs> I think a good question for for really kind of deepening one's thinking about this question is, how many holes are there in a pair of pants? I think one. I think that's kind of like leveling up in the question about a straw. I yeah. think I you convinced me the answer has to be four. Four? Be okay, Ben's intuition about these questions is okay, so much we're not counting the fly. I know. Oh, wait, 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 the fly, is the fly open or closed? Because the fly's closed. The, the fly's fly closed. closed. There's no, there's no where written me. All right, so there's no, no fly. Where are you yes, getting four one, holes, Ben? Well, so wait a minute. It's a so dog, dog one, pants. One big hole to go in. <laughs> then there's two holes that you, yeah. you have a split. So what there's that, one, one two, three, four, five. There's five holes. Ben is screwing with us. Like, what the fuck is that answer? I don't even know. Oh, are we allowed to say that? I'm screwing with us because I thought oh, I yeah, wasn't. No, no, no. You can, you can okay. curse on in lieu of fun. Oh, yeah. So here's, I, I, I want to shift the conversation to a different issue. Because you course. don't like the um, so We've got a few, we've got a number of issues holes. we've got to cover here. But one of them is mathematicians who are socially capable. So this is actually a relatively limited set. And um, no, no, you're definitely in it. Um, uh, query whether you were when you were a small child. But, what? Okay, okay. Carry on. No, so, so you are capable of writing about pretty complicated, you know, really complicated math concepts for a general interest audience. And I remember many, many years ago, um, I got a call from Jack Schaefer, who was then the editor of Slate. And he asked like, who do you, do you know anybody who can like write about math and 
like in a way that people would actually want to read. Cause I want to write a comp run a column called the math guy with like, that would be actually kind of like using math to be. And I said, yeah, I actually do know somebody like that. You should call Jordan Ellenberg. And that was how you started writing for slate. And um, most mathematicians are actually not that socially adept. Um, <laughs> That is, you're they so, don't. You're so you're so mean. But first of all, I feel like you're conflating ability to like write English prose, which with being socially adept. Which have you met writers? No. So I I I think that there is a common skill set of engaging with. They're they're not completely overlapping, but being able to write so that people want to engage with you and being able to talk so that people want to engage with you. They're related skill sets. I mean, I see I, what you're saying. I, I think that's true, but I think that what is really the skill set that we're talking about is teaching. I mean, I think that anytime you're writing for the public, for those of us who are teachers in our day jobs, like it's an extension of our teaching mission. And I think certainly among professors in any subject, uh, there are people who are better teachers and people who are worse teachers. There are people who care about it more and people who care about it less. And I think the sort of the muscles that you build in order to be able to write for Slate or to write books, they're related, but not identical to the muscles that you build to be effective in the classroom. Now it's different because obviously writing is its own specialized skill that you have to train as you guys both know very well. Um, but I think, I think both of those are more related to each other than they are related to kind of generally being like a sort of socially agreeable or affable person. But yet you are in your own way, a socially agreeable and affable person, which is actually- I heard the, that, I heard that Ben, in your no, own no, no, way. No, 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 I mean that in the, like once upon a time, Jordan was not, um, you know, but like you went we're to- deep. We're going deep, you, okay. I'm sorry. We're going deep. Okay. No, no, no. Like, like, like. I, I let me ask you something. When you were in elementary school, were you a socially engaged uh, and um, uh, person with your peers? I mean, that's how I remember it. I mean, I was little, but I mean, Ben's like, Ben's like, you don't remember that you were just like standing in a corner, like. So like, I. Like, <laughs> we all were like, sometimes. I remember that you were, like, there was a real transformation in you in sort of high school, where you were, um, you went from somebody who was less socially engaged to somebody who was more socially engaged. And I, that was a decision. All I can say is I think I perceive more continuity than uh, <laughs> than discontinuity <laughs> there. Um, maybe there's sort of like an underlying internal psychic story that makes sense to me as one continuous thing that, that, that I don't see a radical shift that maybe looks to be so funny. I, I almost feel like I'm being called upon to like run down to the basement get my junior high school yearbooks and like display them on the page for everyone. But no, and one you know them. that everyone just signed in your yearbook until like, until you went through this transformation, Jordan, it was just like, have a nice summer, have a nice summer, <laughs> have a nice summer. And then like, suddenly people were writing you like essays about how cool you were. Um, All right. So the last time you and I saw each other, it was on two inch uh, zoom screens at a zoom funeral for somebody that you and I were both in very different ways, very close to uh, a man named Eric Wallstein. And um, uh, Eric Wallstein, I guess the point of tangency to frame this in, 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 in geometric terms, the point of tangency is that Eric Wallstein once had you wrestle me um, when I was 13 and you were 11. Um, why don't you tell that story as using as uh, the frame, how you think Vladimir Putin would actually do in a fight. <laughs> well, and then hold on. And then you also have to get in there somehow, whether or not Ben himself is a hole or a two holes. How many holes <laughs> there are? <laughs> yeah. 
the thing is, this is, I'm afraid, going to be another one of those moments that I am learning in real time. Ben remembers rather differently from the way that I remember it in that I thought I had to wrestle Wallstein himself. I don't remember wrestling you. I remember you as a- No, you're misremembering, father. my friend. <laughs> This is why this is why we should never have a testing weighed about on 300 pounds. Body. Yeah, I mean, Wallstein was much bigger than both of There's us. There's no way he was 300 pounds. No, I would say there is a way that he was 300 pounds. The way yeah. that, it that if you stood on a scale, it would read the, <laughs> <laughs> the way that Eric was. Jordan used to call him Walter Wallstein. <laughs> was he? A, a lot oh, of that's actually that really was not good. Crazy. That was not yeah. my image. Bullying so, funny. Um, <laughs> Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. In the I, will I will tell you the story since Jordan obviously. <laughs> I in the chat, I and by the way, at this point, I, I do want to I do want to say that many many years later, I called Eric Wallstein because the uh, the older child who you just met, uh, EJ, was showing signs of uh, 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 math precociousness, and Eric had a specialty in teaching, uh, tutoring children with, who were uh, sort of particularly interested in math that uh, dated back to before Jordan, actually, but he was, among other things, Jordan's math tutor. And so when EJ started displaying uh, inclinations in that direction. I called Eric Wallstein and I said, oh, uh, you don't probably don't remember me. And he blurted out, he generally blurted things out. And he, he blurted out, of course I remember you. You flattened Jordan Ellenberg in a wrestling match when you were 13. And so uh, Eric's memory of this was consistent with mine. Uh, Jordan uh, was working with Eric and I was living at their house, actually. This was a, a two-week period in which my family was moving to the Washington area because I was becoming an NIH brat. Jordan was already an NIH brat. And um, I was a couple years older than Jordan. And so I was staying with the Allenberg family as a 13-year-old in order to start school at the beginning of the semester. And uh, twice a week or so, Eric Wallstein would come over to Jordan's house after, after uh, uh, school and he would tutor him in math. And of course they would talk about things that I didn't understand. Um, but one day Jordan was restless and Eric asked him what was up. And he said, I don't know, I wanna learn how to wrestle. And so Eric took us out on the front lawn. He sort of roped me into, this endeavor. And uh, Eric had been a wrestler, I think, in high school or something. And so he set us up to wrestle. And I was, you know, two years older than Jordan and a fair bit larger and also reasonably capable with uh, things like hand-to-hand -hand combat, which Jordan was not. And uh, let's just say the, the match didn't last long. Um, and um, But you remember that as a match with Eric himself? Well, obviously, I remember my defeat, and I've obviously edited the memory to explain that defeat. But the fact that my opponent uh, outweighed me by a factor of I was, you know, probably about three to four. Um, yeah, I did outweigh you, but not by that much. On the other hand, you're the one who's bragging about beating an eleven-year-old. So I'm just <laughs> saying, like, we each have a sort of self-serving nature. Excellent. I mean, I'll say the Eric Wallstein story I would like to tell. And again, you know, we're uh, we're saying this in the spirit of uh, appreciation because we're remembering a guy with a long life. And I'm waiting. Wait, is this is this the same guy who was a math teacher? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and he died started? recently. He he died recently of COVID. Although he was in failing health otherwise, right. and. Um, and he, he was Jordan's tutor and he was my son EJ's tutor um, uh, over many years. And he's a, um, uh, he was, he actually, I mean, all jokes aside, and, and um, he was a remarkable um, cultivator of math and somebody who took 
math in very young people very seriously. And I, I cannot express how rare that is. So that actually tees up very nicely the story I want to tell, which is also partly about the sort of complicated nature of Eric Wallstein. But it's that when I first met him, I was probably eight. I don't know exactly how old. And our, literally the very first conversation we ever had was he wrote a number on the board and said, what is, what's that number? And I'm like, well, that's easy. I know that's 206. And he really, he raised his voice very aggressively. He was like, there's no such number as 206. That number is 206. There's no and in the number. And, and, the, and so the thing about the story is that it's, it would be very easy and not entirely incorrect to look at that interaction and say like, what a weird thing to like yell at a seven year old kid about. Like, you're really gonna yell to me about it. Like, that's like weirdly aggressive. And, and for, but for me, I was like, holy, this is a guy who actually cares. Like, I'd never met anybody who like really cared about it. And I was super excited. So I think my complicated feelings are, the, are from the fact that there probably are kids for whom that would have been the wrong approach. I'm gonna be honest. For me, it was exactly what I needed at that time. But I mean, I, that, and that's that's the sort of the you know the the complicated nature of Eric Wallstein. That um, so that is such an interesting story. Let me tell you a story about the first time EJ met him, which I don't think EJ will get upset at me for. EJ was maybe even a little younger than that, um, and there was another person in the hall in the room when this happened, which was Larry Washington, who is uh, also something. I think something of a mentor to you, right? Absolutely. Um, Larry is a, a math professor at the University of, of Maryland, uh, and he used to come to Montgomery Blair High School to tutor Eric once a week. And they invited EJ over to, EJ was six or seven or something. And Eric walks up to the whiteboard and walks up to the, you know, and writes on it 3x plus 2y and says to EJ in this exact same aggressive tone that Jordan is describing, what does it mean? And EJ says, well, if, if you tell me what X and Y are, I can tell you what it is. This is a six-year-old or a seven-year-old. And Eric just barks at him, that's not good enough. Tell me what it means. And EJ looks at it for a long time and says, well, it means you have two unknown numbers and you multiply one by three and the other by two and you add the results. And Eric says, that's very interesting. No praise, no, no congratulations, no recognition that he's talking to a very small child. He just engaged with EJ as though it were a perfectly normal thing to bark at a small child that way. And EJ left that, I was, I had my heart in my mouth and EJ left that it was the most energizing thing that had ever happened to him. I'm, and it was, um, it was a, uh, it was exciting. It was like, it was exactly what Jordan just described, like somebody who actually cared uh, about what he was thinking at the level that he cared. And he went into the car, sat down in the back seat, and immediately fell asleep. Um, he was literally yeah. knocked unconscious. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing: um, much like me, when I was being asphyxiated by being beneath the mighty bulk of Eric Wallstein during our wrestling match, in this memory I seem to have formed for myself. No, but uh, but I'll say this: I mean, that manner of teaching, it was authentic to him. It worked because it was authentic to him. But I will say that certainly, even though he was a mentor to me as a teacher, I have no taste for that. Like I, I mean. It would. I mean, I think. I think I would lose more students than I would gain by acting that way myself, and I have no taste for it. As yes, and as somebody has pointed out in the, in the chat, Eric uh, was accused of by a number of students of behaving inappropriately in his classroom, um, and I have no doubt that those allegations are true. Not in the sense that he was sexually harassing anybody intentionally, but in the sense that he had very limited sense of propriety and he uh, said exactly what came into his head at all times. And, um, 
and he was, um, uh, I'm sure, in exactly the way that Jordan describes, he was, you know, the the same behaviors that were um, uh, uh, energizing to a certain group of children were menacing to others. And I'm also sure that his propensity to say things, whatever came into his mind at the moment that it came into his mind caused him to say all kinds of things that were inappropriate. So I, I think it is very, very likely that all the allegations about Eric are true and that he, uh, and at the same time that he was incredibly important to the people to whom he was important and that he didn't ever have any consciousness of mistreating anybody. But I think we, you know, I think we now a days do aspire to sort of have a community where every kid who is excited about math, like has an opportunity to get mentored. And I think can simultaneously like strive for that and also like honor people who helped us <laughs> although it was limited, although it was limited to certain people and certain kinds of people who got it. Jordan, I'm, I'm super interested. I was reading, um, I was actually kind of, I was realizing how I little, I kind of knew about you the last time that we met. And so I kind of, I went online, I was reading a little bit about your background, which is how I found the, the straw and topology question, uh, or not your paper on it. I knew the question already, but the, um, I'm kind of interested. So how did you find your way to doing geometry? I mean, of all of the different types of math that you can um, get into, um, you like, I think it's interesting that like, you know, I talk to economists, I talk to like, you know, or any, like they're all versions of math, math like mathematical kind of minds. Why, like why stop or settle? Or like, do you feel like there was something fundam so fundamental about geometry or that it just like it appealed to you um when you kind of were like going through everything and when was that like what how old were you well it's a good question and actually as a kid i would say you know one thing i say in the book is that geometry is kind of the cilantro of math there's like people who love it and there's people who hate it but people are typically not neutral people recognize that's sort of a different subject in nature from the rest of what's taught in high school math. And I'll be honest with you, I, as a kid, was kind of a geometry hater. I would always sort of sort of find some non-geometric way to solve the geometry problem if I at all could. Um, but I think modern research mathematics has become an essentially unified field. So the kind of questions I started out being interested in, which are in a field called number theory, which is very classical, you know, questions about numbers and equations and what can be solved. Um, over the history of that subject, we've now come to see that it is fundamentally geometric in nature. Um, that starts with Rene Descartes like hundreds of years ago, but sort of it really happens in like the middle of the 20th century. Too much to do on our show to like really uh, describe it, but just to say that all kinds of questions we would have thought were like very discrete questions about numbers and what kinds of equations have solutions um, are intimately tied up with like, you know, the geometry of crazily curved high dimensional shapes. And I sort of found myself having to learn about that in order to solve the questions I originally wanted to solve. So in some sense, you know, part of the spirit of this book is it sort of uh, mimics what happened to me in my research life. Now, not very much of the book is about kind of like hardcore research and pure math. A little bit of it is, but mostly not. But that thing of realizing that even the things you thought weren't geometry actually are geometry underneath. Um, that happened to me in my research life. And then like writing about, you know, writing about redistricting, which we can talk about. I mean, this sort of issue of gerrymandering, there's a lot in the book about that. Uh, again, sort of like once you start to think about what's really going on in the guts of the district map, that's a geometric question too. That's not all it is. It's not a pure math question, but if you try to do it without thinking about the geometry of it, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get it wrong. Like we have been getting it wrong actually for years yeah. and years. So that's so like that and kind of your comments about like having a good math mentor bring me to kind of, I get my, my last question, which I think, and then we'll go to audience questions. But I was always quite, I was nothing like you. I was not like, you know, I mean, I was quite good in math. I was one of the, you know, for my, I was normal, but high on like the thing. So I was like an AP Calc when I was like in 10th grade and like whatever. And then like, you, you know. High AP Calc. Okay, I got it. I'm with you. Yeah. Like, I'm not like, it was not like, I was not like some prodigy or something, but I was like, there were not um, 
it, you know, there was not that many people in that, those classes in my school. And then they're just got, I mean, I would say AP Health was maybe the limit. BC was just like, it just didn't make sense. I could memorize all of the stuff, but for the first time, it was just like, nothing was gelling and it was not, I just felt like I had hit my limit. And I remember like, just kind of like studying and studying and giving up on trying to really understand what was happening and realizing that I could just memorize the formula, but not understand the derivation of the formula and get a B plus on like the, on, on like the, on the test. Um, and I'd be fine, but that was it. And I realized it was only going to get worse from there. And so that was kind of the end of math for me. My partner is much better at math and he went all the way into college and to grad school doing math. And then kind of like at some point kind of hit his like limit as well. Did you ever have something like that? And, or have you talked to people in math that like hit that level? Am I like, am I like romanticizing or imagining something? Do you believe that there are cognitive, like there are cognitive, like maybe even structural aspects of a brain that are like better suited for math? Or do you think it's kind of like having a great teacher that can get you through those moments? I think there's a lot of things interlocking. I certainly think that once you know something, it is easy to forget just how hard those things are. And by the way, calculus is not the first time it happens. So, I mean, if you look at like how K-12 math education works, there are several moments where people fall off the bus. Uh, it happens when fractions are introduced and it happens again in algebra. Those are walls for a lot of people. And I think we ought to respect that the reason that those are walls is that they're really difficult. I think we actually do our students a very great disservice if we say like, oh, actually, like it's easy. If actually it's simple, like if we'll only explain it to you. No, these things are incredibly difficult. And like algebra, you know, look, most but algebra made perfect algebra, sense to right? me. It took the smartest people on the planet like many hundreds of years to like work out algebraic notation and how to do it efficiently. Calculus, hundreds of years after that. So I think one thing we can do is just respect more that those things are incredible conceptual advances that people worked incredibly hard to develop and we shouldn't treat them as if they were simple. They're not simple. They're some of the hardest yeah. things we teach in school. Um, I don't actually think... Um, I, I truly do not believe that there that people are like constitutionally incapable of learning calculus or learning wherever it is that your partner stopped or anything like that. I certainly think for all of us, you know, math is a parade through ignorance. Like we always, what's exciting about it is sort of like coming up and coming into contact with things that you really don't understand. If it weren't like that, it wouldn't be enjoyable. It wouldn't be meaningful. Right. Um, I think the problem with calculus, and we could tell a whole kind of geopolitical story, which I don't know that well, so I'm just going to pretend to tell it, and probably I'll get some things about it wrong, is that somehow we decided at some point that taking calculus, we were going to calculusize our schools. It didn't used to be a high school course, right? It used to be I, college. That's I why love IP. that you say this. I love that you say this. Sorry, no one ever talks about this. I mean, people who study math education talk about it all the time. I mean, yeah, it's a, yeah. Um, and, you know, somehow this, the way this decision making work is we say we want more math, more science, more engineering ready, science ready kids going into college. So we're going to make calculus a standard high school course. But the problem is that if you just say by fiat, this is how it's going to be. That doesn't mean that everyone who's 17 and going to college is going to learn calculus, right? It means that everybody is on paper going to have done something that's called learning calculus. Um, and well, you saw it, right? You saw it happen. Yeah. Um, so I don't have an easy answer to that question, by the way, because I think calculus is a great subject and it is important and it is true that students who really learn how calculus works are going to be able to sort of start doing physics faster, start doing engineering faster. And I recognize that there's real value for in that. Um, but it's also true that you can get by with kind of faking it and getting a B plus. That's, that's also true. I don't have an answer. I'm just trying to say like, how did it come about? No, I guess that's just kind of my question. It's like, how how is it that some people, there are certain things from like a cognitive perspective that it's like, we seem to attach this specialness to, like if it's art or music or like mathematics in particular, that there is a, there is a, like a genius that kind of goes along with it, or there's some type of like, but it's a type of genius, like a person that can sit down and play the piano 
without ever having taken a lesson or something, right? A like I like or like um you know a well, personal element. But yeah, go but ahead. That is largely a myth. I mean, you know, there are people who are preternaturally good musicians. But they but, love practicing and they practice but like the crazy. The striking thing when you talk to people who are really wonderful musicians, the striking thing is how hard they work. Yeah. You know, and by the way, the myth of Mozart is a total is not a total myth because he could do incredible things when he was four. But he worked awesomely hard. You know, and and I think, you know, as somebody who knew Jordan as a kid, Jordan actually worked really hard. Um and you know, there's this there's this um there's this myth that there's this like preternatural capability that's divorced from effort and intensity and desire. It's total bullshit. I don't know well, if it's total no, bullshit. I'll buy that it's a fair amount. I want to speak to this issue of desire though, because I think that is the most under discussed aspect. People talk a lot about who's good at math and who's bad at math. And they can talk about it as some kind of born thing. Yes, exactly. We don't talk enough about how much people like math. Yeah. Because the truth is that here's one thing I want to say about myself. If you want to say what's anomalous about me, Jordan Ellenberg, it's how much I like it. I don't go into a classroom thinking, I think everybody in this room should like math as much as I do. No way. It's weird to like it as much as I do. I get and that. By the way, and by the way, for those who don't know, when Jordan questioned how much he liked math he went to graduate school in creative writing um yeah, and, and he actually right. took a, a break, great story took a break from math for a protracted period of time yeah awesome. well, a year but definitely i, I missed that's math a protracted well, period of time. so i mean but the point so the point is that i think I think we can aspire as teachers for our students to like math more than they think they do. Maybe like more, they'll like more about it and find things about it that they like more than they did when they walked out the door. But we're not trying to make little clones of us. There's probably enough mathematicians, to be honest. We probably produce about the right number. We don't need to produce 10 times as many. Um, so, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, like I took this class and I just like never really got it. And they feel like, oh, I was inadequate. I didn't have the capability. In many cases, I would say most cases, no, you just like to really get into it requires working really hard at it and wanting to. And maybe you didn't like it that much and that's okay. It's totally okay like not to like math that much. Certainly okay not to like it as much as I do. And I would, you know, I would say music is the same, Ben. I would say like right? Not not everybody wants to compose a sonata. Like it's not no, because they're, and, they're just not that actually, interested. And actually, I'm a really good example of that. I love music enough to be a oh, right. serious a consumer artist. of it and not enough to be a first rate producer of it Th because it is actually at the end of the day, not how I want to spend my time. Um, and so to, cycle, uh, to cycle back to this question of Eric Walstein and the question of styles of teaching, I think, you know, and I read in the book about this, that I think when I was a, a novice teacher, probably like a lot of novice teachers, I was like, I'm going to figure out the right way to teach math. I'm going to feel like the way that's going to work. And I think over 20 years of teaching, what you learn is that people are just pretty different from each other. And different students are going to respond to different things and different students like different things. There's no magic key. And so as a teacher, um, I try as best I can to kind of give a lot of Things. You know, for the students who like a very abstract approach, I try to give some of that. For the students who like a lot of examples, I like to give some of that. For the students who like me to take it very seriously, I kind of give some of that. For the students who like it very goofy, I give some of that. It, the hope is that somehow every student at some point during the course has something where they're like, that really worked for me. That really gave me a reason to like be here and keep doing it. Hey, you guys both just for me, and I'm not sure if that means something. That just means your internet connection is a little bit hinky. And so it it's saving your bandwidth oh, okay. by not displaying us. You're still there. Okay, great. We are still here. We can still hear you and we can see you. But whenever a uh, bandwidth uh, decreases, it just removes uh, rather than causing you to become uh, uh, um, uh, occasional or it just uh, saves bandwidth by not displaying other images to you.
I thought maybe I'd um, say a magic word like in You Bet Your Life and like the duck fell out of the ceiling. Yeah. That was my moment. <laughs> David Botts, the floor is yours. Greetings. So, uh, so um, I have a statement to make. A nine in 10 probability equals a guarantee. Now, obviously that that's not, not the case, but how would you, being a math person, and I know this is more probabil probability than geometry, but how would you explain that to somebody who maybe looks at a poll and says, oh, there's a 90% chance of something happening, and then it doesn't happen, and then they're like, oh, this is crazy. My whole world is broken. How do we help that person understand that their world is not broken? They just forgot about that 10%. Well, again, a really good question. I think probabilistic reasoning, that's a perfect example of what Kate and I were talking about, of things that we want to make it sound like it's easy, but it's incredibly hard. And actually, there was no mathematical theory of probability until like the 1600s. So again, most of math existed without that. And that was thought to be randomness, was thought to be something like, well, math can't speak to that. It's like random. It's not the kind of thing math is about. So it's hard. Our brains are not really built uh, to be good at that kind of reasoning. I think what I would say is that everybody has loci in their life that are fundamentally uncertain and fundamentally probabilistic in nature. And you got to analyze that. So for me, it's baseball because I like baseball. I know Ben does too. And so for me, I can look up and be like, oh, 10%, that's like if your team is up by three runs, but the other team is a runner on first and there's only one out and it's the bottom of the ninth. Like, are you going to win? Like, yeah, probably you're going to win, but you're a little more nervous than you were when you were up by three runs and there's two and, and two outs and nobody on, you know what I mean? So like, and you can easily match except for any given statement of probability, you can match like a game situation and be like, okay, I know how that feels. I know how to feel about that. Now for me, it's baseball for somebody else who doesn't care about baseball. That's not going to work. And there's going to be some other context in which they're used in, which makes sense. So, that, that, so that's what I would say. I would say, I would say find an analogy because you're absolutely right, David, that that raw number uh, is for most people, not going to be that helpful. Right. Ben, you're muted. Ben, you're muted. We can't hear you, Ben. Let the questioner talk while Ben is oh, muted. Steve, I guess, Steven, I guess I'm how do you I'm pronounce your last it. name so I don't mangle it in the future? Is it Buonapane? Correct. Steven Excellent. Good bread. Correct. Uh, so, Tell us about your experiences teaching this semester. Presumably you adopted some new techniques for either students that were remote or you may have been remote. Uh, and are there any ideas from this semester that you will continue to use once things go back to fully in person? It's a big challenge. And I think basically anyone who's teaching this semester would tell you the same thing if they're teaching in a non-physical uh, scenario like we are for most of our classes at the University of Wisconsin. Um, you know, we are used, you realize how much you're used to getting some level of feedback, even from the kids who don't talk. I think that's what I learned. I was like, of course, I know that there's sort of students who speak up, raise their hand, blah, 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 blah. But what I've learned now is that, boy, I was getting a lot of kind of nonverbal feedback just from the students who were sitting there and not saying anything. And so without that, you do feel much more like you're talking into the void. And I wish I could say I have like developed awesome technique for dealing with this and circling those students in. Um, I don't think I've succeeded so well this semester if I'm allowed to like tell on myself as a teacher. I think there's sort of some population of students in my class who like it's almost like they're not there. I mean they're doing the homework so I know that they exist but like if they don't turn on their cameras and they don't speak it's like I it's like they were watching they might as it's like they were watching it on YouTube later or something like that. So that's honestly I'm gonna be straight with you and feel like I feel like that's not a success for me as a teacher. Um, and I'm open. But one thing I will say, and I think, again, a lot of my teaching colleagues have said this, is that the chat is really nice, actually. That's like a different kind of channel than people raising their hands in class. And the ability of students to talk to each other in a way that doesn't disrupt the lecture, um, that's kind of a cool addition. Um, I don't really know if we could sort of bring some version of that into the physical classroom, but I do actually feel like it adds something, not as much as it's subtracted by the lack of being in the room together, but it's it's something that I've liked. Daniel, who is back in his native habitat, the black shirt against the black chair, uh, the floor is yours, sir. 
So I'm curious, do you think high schools and universities should spend more time teaching students how to do back of the envelope calculations since they can kind of provide intuition checks for plausible answers? Or do you kind of reject the premise of the question? Um, here's my challenge. First of all, I always have to stop myself from trying to say anything authoritative about K-12 education because it's a profession, right? Actually studying how K-12 education works. There are empirical questions about what's effective and what's not. And I'm not an expert in that area. I'm a parent of, you know, two students in K-12, but like, I don't have like direct expertise. I'll say this, here's the challenge. Whenever anybody says like, wouldn't it be great if high school math classes did X? I always say like, wow, that would be great because math is great. So when you say that, I'm like, boy, it would be awesome if we spent more time doing that. You have the challenge that in a high school environment, more time spent doing one thing is less time spent doing something else. So I always try to like have some discipline and be like, okay, what am I mentally throwing out? Like, I don't think we do, I don't think we do a ton of stuff that's not worthwhile now is what I'm saying. So um, I hear about stuff, so, but, but I'm basically completely on board. I think that we, and it, it speaks to Kate's point actually, that like it helps prevent students from doing things purely by rote in a purely formal way where the question is not connected to like a real physical question. If we ask them to sort of estimate to do back of the envelope computations, that said, I want to emphasize having two kids in K-12, there is a lot of that in the curriculum now. If you are if you went to school 30 years ago, you might not know that, but there totally is that kind of thing in the curriculum. And I can tell you that you will hear parents complain about it and say like, I met, why did the, why did the teacher ask my kid to give the wrong answer to a question? What does this estimate? Like you could just like add it up and get the exact answer. Like this gushy, mushy, like modern day thing and right answer is not important. Like what is this? So I feel, I mean, running a K-12 curriculum is like really hard because whatever you do, somebody's gonna be pissed at you. If you put something in, you're taking something out and people are gonna be pissed. Whatever the new thing is, it's gonna be unfamiliar and people are gonna be pissed. You cannot do that job without pissing a lot of people off all the time and I don't envy the people who have to do it, but it's a damn important job. So that's actually a really interesting, um, uh, I've failed to bring her in um, but Alice Lee has a, uh, in addition to whatever technical problem is coming, preventing her from coming on to answer this, she uh, asks a related question, which is, do you think current high school curriculum is serving its purpose? Uh, and she says, anticipating your earlier point, sorry if this isn't your wheelhouse. Um, uh, I take it the from your last comments that your answer to that is you don't think the high school curriculum is wildly off in its substance. I think the high school curriculum and the college curriculum too, to say this is something I know a little better and have more experience with, I think it has a lot of overlapping purposes and that's part of what makes it so difficult. I mean, let's be frank, one thing that, and not just in math either, one thing the high school and college curriculum is doing is acting as a sorting mechanism and saying like, oh, this student got like a high AP score and an A in this class. It's actually pretty great at that. Now, whether you think that's a good purpose or a bad purpose, I don't know, but let's be honest, it's one of the purposes and, it's, and it is effective at that, at putting students in a rank order, which you can decide for yourself like what it means, if anything. Um, and I also, well, think, but I also think it does teach a lot of math. I think there's no question of that. It does teach a lot of kids a lot of stuff, um, but it doesn't teach everybody everything. And it probably differentially fails to teach kids with a certain style or certain characteristics, like certain things. I mean, that's what we got to work on. But I, I it, it's very, so it's very Alice, hard. Alice adds in the chat that she was going to expand on this question. Okay. That the possibility of shaping it around statistics, not calc since uh, statistics is more important to being a good citizen, you and I are both the children of statisticians. You are the child of two statisticians. I am the child of only one statistician. Uh, what do you think about organizing high school math around, around statistics? I have a well-formed take on this very question because it's something <laughs> that, because it's something this is so, I mean, because this it is sounds cool. very appealing and there are good reasons to do it. At the same time, you know, we look at like this very rote calculus class, like people being asked to do what you did, Kate, and say like, wouldn't it be better if we had like a statistics class be more meaningful, more related to current events, like blah, 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 blah. We run a very serious risk of comparing the, the thing that we have to the thing that we imagine having. 
And I can one thing. I, so one thing I feel very confident about is that if we rolled out statistics at the same scale as we did calculus, and we're getting there, by the way. Statistics AP used to be very small. Now a lot of people take it. You already see this happening. Um, a statistics class that was taught in every high school in America would have exactly the same problems that the calculus class we teach in every yeah. high school in America has now. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we would have the same kind of kids doing things by rote and not learning the concepts problems uh, that we have now. So, so. I think there's an argument for it, but the argument should not be that we would be like traveling through this field of petunias, but like everything was very conceptual and like everybody would like, and just, it would sort of automatically happen that sort of everyone would like deeply engage with these concepts. It wouldn't. So, so not to like, not to kind of, but like one of the things that I think is interesting and I ended up doing is like inadvertently was that I preferred, I actually liked my, like some programming. And so I programmed my T89 to like derive all these formulas for me and show me the work. And Love I was it. fine with that. Like that was how I, and that was how one of the ways that I got through because I had this T89 and I could just do that. And that I liked, and that turned out to be super useful once I turned and had to use Stata and SPSS and like all this other stuff to try and like to learn R to like do statistics work. But it was more useful to have learned coding because it was like coding was the tools to use yeah. the math and to like turn it into a solvable problem versus like learning the math itself. And I, that was all stuff I had to teach myself. And so like- You I, were learning math itself. I mean, to me as a teacher, yeah. I'm like, that's a complete success story because uh, what an, a sort of enterprising student will find the thing that they like doing that's meaningful, that aspect of the subject they like and concentrate on that. And that is, and that is great. Now we can't ask every student to be that enterprising. It's not realistic, right? I mean, we need to provide an, an atmosphere where you don't have to be sort of an educational entrepreneur on your own uh, to learn something, but you did it and that's great. But can I say one more thing about the statistics thing though, because I don't want to forget it. Is that everything I said about like, oh, fractions are a lot harder than numbers. Algebra is a lot harder than fractions. Calculus is a lot harder than algebra. Guess what? Statistics is a hell of a lot harder than calculus. Yeah. Yeah, the difficulty of conceptually. If you think calculus comes about in the 1700s, statistics in its modern form doesn't exist until the 20th century. I mean, and there's a reason for that. So there, there is no way. I mean, it is a fundamentally difficult subject whose conceptual underpinnings are even today hotly contested in a way that the foundations of calculus. Well, they they certainly were 100 years after Newton, but not they are not anymore. Statistics is still kind of like that. So uh, it is, there are, there's a good argument that it's more relevant. There's no argument in hell that it's easier. All right. Um, we are going to Hi. leave it there. And before we wrap up tonight, I, uh, I'm going to do something that I should have done three or four weeks ago, yeah. uh, which is to uh, ask Maggie, Caroline, Feldman Pilch, uh, who is a longtime uh, viewer of In Lieu of Fun, and who has an incredible conference that she's putting together tomorrow. Full disclosure, I am on her board of the NatSec Girls Squad, which is doing this conference. But I, uh, given that I have uh, recommended attendance at this conference to not one, but two In Lieu of Fun viewers over the last few days, I thought uh, having Maggie tell a little bit about what she was gonna do uh, before we wrap up would be a good idea. So Maggie, the floor is yours. Uh, and, and it's funny that we were talking about stats versus calc because actually my reoccurring stress stream is that Wesleyan University where I went to undergrad finds out that I never took algebra two or pre-calc and instead took statistics because I couldn't do the other ones and then revokes my degree. Um, and I in fact did have that stress stream in the last week, probably related to the conference. Um, so Ben is right, registration for the conference closes tomorrow. The conference itself starts December 1st and ends December 4th. But since we live in pandemic times, um, we decided that the best way to do a conference is to build a piece of technology that will enable us to communicate with each other as close to being in person as we could be without killing each other, right? Like, cause that's crucial. Um, so when you register for the conference, you actually, um, you join this platform for a whole year and 75% of the people on this screen, um, Jordan, you can also do it if you want, um, are all speaking at the conference, which is really exciting, right? So if you wanna come here, um, Kate, talk about technology governance and content moderation, 
this is your jam. If you want to talk to Ben about writing an op-ed or watch us drink cocktails and him get an award called the Good Fucking Man Award that we call the gem or the Good Executive Man Award. Congratulations, Ben. <laughs> we can now say Mazel Bueno because like, turns out there's a Sephardic Jew in the cabinet, but that's a different episode. <laughs> Um, I'm counting. It's Ew. very exciting. It's very, there are, York. right. It's a big deal. He's a Cuban Jew. It's very, very exciting in this house right now. Um, so the conference is next week. NATSEC Girl Squad, the purpose of the organization is to build what we call competent diversity and national security and defense. So um, it's nice when you, you know, want to serve your country and the larger society. It's better when you know, like, huh, I'm good at this thing and I feel really confident in my ability to do it and like people are gonna back me up. So it's four days. Um, the NATSEC Girl Squad itself um, is not four days, it is all days. We have done at the last count as of this morning, uh, 983 events, not, not counting partner events. Um, yeah, since March 13th. Um, anybody can be a Nuts at Girl Squad member. Thank you to whoever's putting that in the chat. There are t-shirts, there are jackets, um, there are pins, there are lanyards. There's re you can get a tattoo. I have that, it's great. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of purple. Um, it's a really good. Wait, time. is it like is it a Natsec Girl Squad conference the, tattoo? Um, can you see that it says Natsec? Oh, yeah. There we go. There it yeah. Is. yeah, it's real. That's, 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 you guys got a real good shot uh, right here on the platform. Um, no, so the conference. I have a Sharpie yeah. marker. That's about you as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> Um, but it's going to be really great. Um, and one of our favorite things to do, which is, I think, very much in the in the spirit of in lieu of fun, um, is that we get really super senior people like Ben, like Kate, like this woman, Lori Welch, who is the chief emerging talent officer for the entire intelligence community. And they sit on a panel with somebody who is like still an undergrad. And all people are equal, and everybody um, everybody is listened to, everybody is heard, um, and you can communicate one on one. You own your own data. It's a really great time. Uh, the platform's called Herd Mentality because everything we do is unicorn themed, um, and it's gonna be. I don't know. I think it's gonna be great, Kate. I can't believe this is your first conference. It's my first. I'm excited. I might get a tattoo by the you end could. of it. It's just really, let's oh leave God. it open to possibilities. I have so many possibilities. Like we have, um, we have uh, workouts being led by like the senior, uh, by senior military officers. We have a movie night. Um, there's a dogs of NATSEC Girl Squad session, which is crucial, like very, very important. Um, there's a, a rumor that Chesty, Sergeant Chesty, who is the mascot of the Marine Corps, will be making an appearance. Whoa. Um, yeah, which is like the most important bulldog I've ever met. Um, like, it's gonna be great. Um, All right. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and I will be doing my, um, my two hour workshop on how to write an op-ed from which you I kind of want to go to that learn how to write an op-ed you already know right. how to write an op-ed I know but, but I want to see how someone else talks about it it's this like, is um, the op-ed is an exceptional rarefied form that has certain core elements and uh you can learn how to write it I have written about 2,000 of them um oh my God. and oh my God. um is well, if you include true? editorials. Yeah, because okay, I wrote well, editorials for Washington Post for 10 years. Hobby, but then I, I don't think I literally, I think I literally don't have that many opinions. Amen. I do not um, have that funny, many opinions. It's never been your I job to have an opinion. I would be down to like what kind of pasta shape is better if I tried to get down to like 2,000. Yeah, opinions. I mean, then you could one, do of the, one of the things about doing that every day for, for nine years is that you do learn what the core elements of the form are and how to do it very fast. And it becomes like a practiced thing, kind of like as you describe math concepts that um, that are, you know, you don't remember how hard they are and after you've learned them. Mm -hmm. right. uh, the op-ed is actually a good example of that. It is kind of in my blood. I can write them in my sleep. 
um, strange. And, um, and, um, and I do know what the elements of them are and how they work. And so I have this little two hour seminar. I've get, given it for Maggie's group before. Um, and I um, encourage you to come join us if you have any aspiration ever to write an op-ed in your life. Uh, it'll be two hours reasonably well spent. Yeah, um, and Ben, would you mind just giving a, a quick preview of of the op-ed that you often use, just to you know wet wet people's appetite, so they can really understand the vibe. The op-ed that I always use as an example is uh, of the pure form that plays with the form a little bit, but also respects the respects the form. Is the op-ed that Maureen Dowd wrote that is a sexual fantasy that you about Monica Lewinsky that you think the whole way through the op-ed is Bill Clinton fantasizing. And then right at the end, you learn that it's actually Ken Starr fantasizing. It is a particularly brilliant uh, use of the form by not actually one of my favorite op-ed writers and columnists, but it is extremely clever. Um, so I'm trying I just want to endorse what Ben said that it's a very specific literary form. And you know, I do a, I don't do 2000, but I write like more op-eds than most professional mathematicians write. And people, a lot of people have things they want to say and they ask me like, how do you get an op-ed like in the newspaper or something like that? And I think people think it's just like stating your opinion. Whereas in fact, it's as specific as a sonnet, like what it, you can do in an so op-ed. That is a really interesting example because that is the example that I always give at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this seminar. That learning to write an op-ed is like learning to write a sonnet. It's a very specific form. It has elements that, without which, the thing will not work in its form. And if you uh, and learning to write in the form is a very good way of building larger work. Um, right. So, do you teach the etiquette of like how to ask for a pitch or how to like do? No, because I also no, think no, that's part about of it. how to write them, not about yeah, how to. We do have, to, to we have a pre-recorded session um, on that, and in fact, another in lieu of fun guest, uh, Carrie Johnson herself, will be on hand to do media training and talk to you about how to pitch. We she's have amazing. something for. She's wow. amazing. We have a little bit of everything. I'm not gonna lie, like. This might be, um, I have just been told according to the interwebs that this is the largest by both uh, number of days, number of sessions, number of speecher, uh, speakers, um, national security and defense symposium in the world, which is fucking wild. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Like, what about UNGA? And they were like, no, it's actually bigger than UNGA now. And I was like, Wait till That's everyone amazing. finds out it's really me and some fabulous interns. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, guys. You next week. Jordan Allenberg, you're a great American and a great Wisconsinite. You should probably cut your hair. Um, Never. Maybe not. Sometimes. Um, Jordan, don't cut your hair. We've both been growing it out. I haven't cut mine since March or February. Kate, who is our guest tomorrow? Uh, do you know? I don't know. I don't. Uh, do I get to pick? No, I think uh, it's. I think we have somebody scheduled. Um, oh, it's Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer Mer Mer Chick Mersica. Oh, thank God that you messed it up because that's why I didn't say even attempt the last well, game because know how I was. Not. I don't know either, and I feel terrible mispronouncing it. So well, that'll also be our first question. Guess, well, that's going to be our first question. Yeah. Also, a guest uh, demanded by the audience. That will be 22 hours and 45 minutes from now. And by the way, I want to say that was an example of arithmetic, not geometry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and until now, the clock is a circle. You use the fact that it's a circular form. No, the it's other true. Round, 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 round. Right, Don't get him started about time being a flat circle, Jordan. Yeah, I don't, don't. believe that time is a flat circle. Yeah. All circles <laughs> are flat. It's just like if it's not a sphere for crying out loud, a circle is by definition flat. Um, we don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we can continue to grow our hair until we get vaccinated. I was going to say we can count our holes. 
but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, <holes> too. <laughs> See you tomorrow, people. Bye, Jordan. Bye.